The MTV Fitness Podcast is officially back with a bang. I've wanted to bring it back for ages and for whatever reason, I think I've kept pulling it off and then there's been the technical side of things. But now I'm committed. I'm working with Zach, my videographer, who's got all the fancy equipment. So the podcast is officially back. Got four guests booked in already and we've literally just recorded the first one, which you're about to listen to now. So the way that it's going to work, we're going to have a guest one week and then the next week it's going to be me doing a solo podcast and then there'll be a guest the next week and so on. So it's going to be wicked to have you back and listen in. Today on the podcast, we've got Cole Williams, who, if you've been around for a while, I did on my very first podcast, which was a good three years ago, I reckon. So we talk about loads of interesting stuff. We just bought two new Yetis, so we have a good chat about that. We talk about bike shots. We talk about right laws and whether you should be able to ride trails and not. We talk about tons of stuff, but particularly interesting, we go into detail talking about chain reaction cycles and wiggle and everything that's going on right there. And Col is also sadly the owner or co op or uh, past owner, I should say, of Fly Distribution, which is recently closed. Now, they were the distributor for KTM Bikes, so we talk all about that and what's gone on there. So I think I find the podcast really interesting. We chat about loads of good stuff. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for listening. When we get into it, we go straight in. Enjoy. So you've got two new Yetis. I have. It's nice to have something that isn't a 90s Yeti. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the option came up sort of, well, about November time. Saw that the SB160 was out. I wanted a long travel 29er. Then I saw the price and had to, uh, I think. <laughs> but luckily, I know some people at Yeti from back in the day. Um, so the idea was done. And it took me quite a while to get the first one built up because I just have to, kept changing group sets um, and then took it to Italy and hyperextended my knee. So oh, not no. the best start. Oh, nightmare. <laughs> On a crash? Or? Well, it wasn't really a crash. I just was forgot that I hadn't been riding mountain bikes fast for quite a while and went with eight guys who'd been racing in Jura Worlds for the whole time that oh, I haven't been. Okay. So first run down, classic rookie era. was like, yeah, man, I'm ace. This bike's ace. <laughs> and then hit a jump. I was like, oh, I'll just jump that. Turned out it was a spine. So I landed about eight foot to flat on my oh, leg and spent the rest of the week just had my SPDs fully, like, fully tight so I couldn't unclip, so I couldn't put it. And it's been... What was that, March? So we're on nine months and it's still not right. Oh, nightmare. So. I did, funnily enough, when I went from my Yeti SB6, which is 27 and a half, went up to the SB150, which is 29. I was going down Boat Lane, which you'll know. Yeah. Um, and it was so much faster, I didn't realise. And I was getting, it's a longer bike, so without realising, I was more off the back end. It was literally my first descent and I had similar like I didn't actually crash. I managed to stop it, but I managed to stop it by putting my foot out into the ground at like yeah, 20 right. mile an hour. So I did the same for my knee and like did the ligament. I was like, God damn it, first one. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a proper rookie error. And I was just like, oh, Oh, like the number of times I've been on trips over the years where someone, usually an idiot, has hurt themselves first run, you've been like, oh man, you, you fool. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's my turn. Brilliant. So I just had to suck it up for the rest of the week. It was yeah. amazing riding, but yeah, just got it. It's not the same when you got a niggle though, is it? No. And it was like massively swollen. So I was all right on the bike because it's the rotation, the movement in the knee wasn't either extension or compression. It was just in that middle point. Yeah. Walking, I couldn't do. And I couldn't really, I still can't kneel down. Oh my God. Because the swelling in the back of the knee is pretty bad. So yeah, um, the bike was, I've basically, my wife makes a joke that it's too good for me. Like, <laughs> That's I need too to fast. Get, yeah, yeah. Because when we were in Italy, it was the weekend when Yeti won the men's and women's EDR in Tasmania. So I'm on the bike like, oh, I've got the full factory, like all the gear. <laughs> Like it really is me. I can't blame the link. bike. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's always been my kind of like way to ride. Is have everything you possibly can so that the excuse it, 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 they don't do it. Really. <laughs> just you're not good enough, mate. <laughs> so. No, it's nice. It looks good. The one sixty. I don't. I think it's just kind of like a gentle step up from mine. I imagine and it's slightly more travel and slightly like yeah, different I think they geometry. Just some of the geometry and stuff. It just feels. I mean, I am very out of the loop on the sort of high end mountain bike stuff because the brands we worked with i was just racing road and doing that kind of stuff so it was like i'd gone almost 10 years without riding properly aggressive mountain bikes so the sb160 is better than the downhill bikes i was racing on because the last trip i did we worked out it was like 10 years went to malaga testing for some stuff on the downhill bikes and that was the last time i'd flown with a mountain bike for a trip riding and it was yeah, basically yeah. 10 years and even on the enduro bikes i know when i've been to ride some of the downhill tracks in Leithen or A Forest in places, it's quicker on the modern Enduro bike than what? it was on the 26 inch yeah, wheel yeah. downhill bikes. They were so small as well, weren't they? Yeah. Like well, my, uh... 
I've got a Yeti Lower 9, which is 2002. Okay. So it's a full on downhill world level race bike. And you put it next to the 160, and it's like. <laughs> it's tiny. Yeah. If you watch any videos, if you see like Steve Pete's old videos and whatnot, and the bike looks so small. Yeah, yeah. Super oh. narrow bars. Like it was just revolutionary when we went to. We had to get bars extended to 760 because yeah. no one was making them. <laughs> and now it's like, oh yeah, 810. Yeah, <laughs> it's like yeah. ridiculous. But, and you got, so you got the SB160 and you got an SB120. Is that what you got? Yeah. yeah. How do yeah. they compare? I know obviously it's much more I think the SB120 but... is, again, it's a bit more trail bike than an XC race bike. Okay. I've got it set up with the carbon wheels and a probably a longer stem than Yeti would spec. Yeah. Because I wanted something that was going to be a bit more racy because I wanted more of a difference to the 160. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's very capable. Um, I've not ridden it enough to really test it or get the best out of it. I'm still getting used to the, also it feels so different because I've had a long travel e-bike and a long travel Yeti, yeah. but I get on that and it feels f a bit flimsy. Yeah. Not f it just feels a bit sketchy because the carbon bars, carbon wheels, it just feels a bit sketchy, but I think more time on that this winter. And that's one on a race next year. Yeah. I want to do some sort of cross country marathon sort of stuff. Oh, okay. I think it'll be more fun yeah. and more a bit more fitness based yeah than a hardcore cross country bike yeah. so yeah it's good I the like 160 it. pedals well though doesn't it like, yeah I was climbing, really surprised yeah. yeah yeah I rode it quite a lot in the Alps this summer and in Finale and pedaling up the like road coals and some of the big climbs it's fine yeah it doesn't yeah. really bother at all does it you can just sit and spin obviously yeah, it's links. heavy well it's not heavy is it but it's heavy compared to the 120 yeah um, and it's just a bit more the angles are a bit mm, because they're more aggressive for the downhill. Yeah. You just feel you're sat on it a bit more than the, yeah. the 120. But yeah, I'm, I'm glad I've got both. It was a lucky situation with I had a basic build kit that I could put on the 120. Um, it's got the black box, not the orange box. But okay. I'll cope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to get on spray. Yeah. Well, that's what I was like going to do. And I was like, oh, it just, yeah, it gets a bit too fancy for the amount of riding I'm doing on it. But, yeah. <laughs> so have you still got e-bike, e-bikes, I imagine? No, I did have an e-bike and then I sold it just before, just when I got back from the Alps because someone offered me some money for it and I was like, I'm not going to use it over the winter and um, I want to get a new one next year from a different brand. So I've sort of ordered it. All oh, right. But it depends what happens with work or what happens with bikes and stuff. So I always want to have an e-bike yeah. and I haven't got one currently. Oh, okay. And I did enjoy it riding in the Alps because we took it one of the days I went riding with some mates in Lazark and we went riding totally off away from the lifts on some amazing trails that you just wouldn't have access without the yeah. bike. Um, I think it's somewhere like that. The amount of climbing, like it might be what, four, three, four, five thousand feet or oh, something? Yeah. We just, it was an insane, basically the day's ride on an e-bike was almost like one downhill because yeah. we just rode up and up and up and yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, Middle yeah. of nowhere and it came down all snowshoe paths and all that kind of stuff. It was brilliant. Yes. Um, so... It's a weird bike to have because unless you've got other people who ride e-bikes, it's pretty antisocial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's why I'm not too fussed about not having one this winter. Yeah, I'd quite like to ride and work on the short travel bikes yeah. and that kind of stuff. I think it depends who. Like I, my mate Chris, who rides, he rides an e-bike exclusively. But whenever we ride together, he knows that he's riding at my pace. Yeah. So it makes me push a little bit harder on the climbs. And at some point, he'll be chatting. I'll be like, right, I'm dying now. I need to yeah, uh, yeah. focus on breathing. But he'll just chat away to me. But I think as long as the person riding the e-bike with a non-e-biker knows that the pace is, goes off the non-e-biker, yeah, it's fine, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. But then I can <laughs> I can imagine you well, doing loops Well, I just like up. to go <laughs> You uh, like to go fast. fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. So the whole point of an e-bike is like... You go fast like, on a non-e-bike. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just ride it in turbo, go as fast as you can all the time. It just turns the boring uphill bits into... Yeah, into fun. Fun. So yeah, I can see. I mean, I'd rather just, if I'm going on that ride, that's the joy of having multiple bikes is you can be a bit more. But then you're always, I wish I'd have a bike. Yeah. Wish I'd have a bike. Yeah, but, yeah. Are they getting lighter now? I'm not really in touch with the e-bike. I've been, when, last time I rode an e-bike was when we went out on one, which must have been, I don't even know, three years ago, four yeah, years ago. Are they getting lighter now? I know you can have the lighter versions, can't you? It's, with a, the smaller it's one batteries. of those weird things that I've never really understood. Well, I do understand the logic to it, but I'm of the opinion that if you're going to buy an e-bike, buy an e-bike. Yeah. The compromise is almost like, well, just buy a normal bike. Okay. It's like e-bikes have got to the level and the weight they are, and you don't worry about the weight because you're riding it like that. So my e-bike was 180 mil travel, rear 190 front, 220 rotors. Absolutely like beast. it's an absolute monster, but that's what it's for. Yeah. And then you see people who buy these like super lightweight ones that yeah. have got lighter motors, lighter batteries, less range. And it's like, well, eventually we're going to evolve that back to, oh, look, 
it's a normal bike. Yeah, exactly. So, and it also it means that they can't ride if they're going to ride it as it's intended with people on normal bikes. Yeah. And equally, they can't ride with people on e-bikes. Yeah, of course. It's just in the middle somewhere. Oh, so but if you can have one bike, I can see why that might be the one. Yeah. But I don't find the weight a problem because I'm used to downhill bikes anyway. Yeah. And it's like, we just if you have to lift it up over a gate every now and then, it's not disastrous. If yeah. you're super lightweight and haven't got the strength to lift the e-bikes over gates, I yeah. can see that will be a problem. Yeah. yeah, I remember when we rode together, I forget his name, but there was a guy who was like that absolute XC whippet. And he was like, you know, like really skinny. No yeah. offense to him. Like, I don't mean yeah, in a yeah, bad way, but yeah. he was just, and he couldn't, we had to lift yeah. it over for him, didn't he? Yeah. But then saying that, chances are that the people who are the XC Whippets probably aren't the people buying e bikes in 99% well, of the time, are yeah, they? That's it. Yeah. So I think it's an evolving marketplace, and the people, are, some people get stressed about, oh my God, it costs 15 grand or whatever. And it's like, well, yeah, we don't have to buy the 15 yeah, grand one. Yeah. It's like cars or anything else that as the market matures the high-end stuff becomes more high-end because people are prepared to get it. But if you look at the price of what you can get for four grand on e-bikes or two grand on normal bikes, whatever it is, the quality at that price point is loads better than it was any number of years ago. Yeah. So yeah, you can spend silly money on e-bikes, but then you look at the e-bike and go, well, you get a motor and all the suspension yeah. and it's still cheaper than some road bikes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we've just got nothing. Do you think that they'll properly like take over in like... Or do you think I'd, there'll always uh, be people who ride both? Or do you think that they'll be like, do you know what I mean? Do you think there'll be people who, well, there will be people who will never ride an e-bike for whatever reason. That's obviously up to them. Yeah. What do you reckon will happen in the next sort of like 10, 15 years? I think that it's already happening that anywhere you go to ride now, there's more e-bikes. I yeah. was really surprised in like Morzine and places this summer to how many e-bikes were getting on the chairlifts. And yeah. Stuff. And I can see that for most people, they're just better yeah because you can ride it just as hard you can ride just as far you can get just as fit or not fit but equally mountain biking has got a problem with its obsession with controlling access to the sport okay <laughs> do you know what I mean it's a bit like oh so you think it's a bit of, well there is a bit of ego isn't there from yeah people call... and it's like a skate park sort of thing where you have <coughs> like everyone looks down at the next level and it's like no you'll you haven't earned the right to be cool enough to come and ride these places yeah, yeah. and mountain biking has got a real problem with that and e-bikes the reason i think it caused so much upset for people is it takes away the oh you haven't had to pedal up here okay like the exclusivity yeah, of yeah. it yeah i know what you mean and that i think is part of the people who are like oh well i've been riding these trails for all this time and now there's loads of e-bikers coming in yeah and it's like yeah but if we have more people using the trails and also the e-bikes have basically saved the mountain bike industry because of all the money that's going to the shops people spending money and servicing them and they don't buy them online as much because they want to have the technology support and that kind of stuff. So it's a much, it's a good thing for the industry. Um, but oh, I don't know. The, 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 there's a lot of people still, and I still, if I only had to have one bike, yeah, it would be an e-bike. Would it? Yeah, I think so. Wow. It does change every now and then. I keep thinking maybe I wouldn't. I presume a lot of people that you see in like Morsi and who are going to the uplift with their e-bikes only have an e-bike, I yeah. presume, because you wouldn't take an e-bike unless if you had a normal bike. Yeah normal you know what i mean yeah you wouldn't um you probably wouldn't take it would you so i suppose the people there with the e-bikes the people who only have an e-bike and they're going on a trip away yeah. so they're putting it on an uplift yeah. or do. you get the lift one place and then you you can ride up uh, somewhere else okay. as well so i think there's loads of good reasons for it and i i just there is always going to be people who don't want an e-bike or yeah. don't because it obviously costs extra money so it's probably like a grand and a half extra for the bike so if you've got x amount of money to spend is do you put that grand and a half into an e-bike yeah or do you have kashima or di2 or yeah do you know what i mean it's like it's where you spend the money yeah so you can buy a cheapish aluminium full suspension e-bike with a good motor and battery and it's equivalent of like i mean my, my sp160 you get a very good e-bike for that money yeah and i've just got fancy stuff on mine that's basically jewelry yeah I think as well, it depends on the group that you ride in. So if you ride in a group who don't have e-bikes, if there's 10 of you and none of them have e-bikes, you're probably not, if you can only have one bike, you're probably not going to be the odd one out and get an e-bike. Yeah. It almost takes everybody to get them, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, that's what I knew from the sort of industry when I was working with e-bikes and things is what happens in that exact circumstance is one person gets an e-bike. Yeah. And then within about eight months, <laughs> Everyone everyone's got an e-bike. <laughs> so that's how it sort of starts is that people just see their mates with e-bikes. And after you've had the first few rides of giving them abuse for cheating, and you get on it and go, oh, well, this is fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can get 10 times as much downhill in a yeah, day. Yeah. And also the people who complain about it being cheating, it's like, well, I've seen you on a chairlift. Yeah. And as well, I've said this before, a few of like, it's gone viral a couple of times, a post that I've put on when it's about people who say that e-bikes are cheating 
can't really complain when they're riding a like myself a 160 mil bike with like 29 inch wheels and it's super lightweight and it's the perfect geometry and it's got a dropper post and it's yeah, got yeah. however many gears you've got like it's all of that like it all of that makes it easy you're not you're well, not I riding mean, a rigid bike are i've you? had well i've started mountain biking in sort of 88 89 and i remember people on the hill when we were 14 15 being like oh yeah suspension's cheating <laughs> and then it was disc brakes oh why have you got disc brakes that's just like not you don't need that for mountain biking yeah. then it's like everything's just getting better and better yeah and it's not the same thing yeah. like if you want to race cyclocross or hill climb on a road bike or enduro mountain biking or downhill mountain biking or bmx whatever it is there's all these different types of bikes and we're very lucky that an e-bike is classed as a bicycle yeah and our industry gets to benefit from it yeah and it just means that either you get more riding or more people can ride. Yeah. Because people, like, you go on a skiing holiday and don't spend your entire life training to ski. Yeah. So you should be able to go to the Alps on a mountain bike holiday or go to trail centers and that kind of stuff and be able to just ride bikes. If it takes away the gateway control that, well, you have to spend six grand to get a bike that's worth doing. Because that's part of the problem is that if you ride for years, if you spend money on a very entry level bike, it was generally a bit rubbish. And therefore put you off. Yeah. So people would buy a bike and be like, well, I didn't enjoy that. It yeah. Punched the first time or the suspension was all over the place or whatever it was that would actually put you off the sport. So that's the same with kids' bikes and everything else. If you buy essentially a really cheap, not necessarily, well, not necessarily cheap, but just a bad product, it can put people off the sport yeah. for life. So actually giving people the opportunity to ride something that's really good and not be just destroyed by the lack of fitness can get people into buying a second bike yeah. and a third bike, which yeah. is what you want from an industry. Yeah, because if you go for a ride and you've never ridden before, you do need to be fit. Unless you're a runner or a swimmer or you do something that's cardio yeah. heavy, you're going to struggle on your first ride because even like, especially around here, like, you know, you ride here, but almost all the climbs yeah, are there's no flat steep. Way, yeah. Like, yeah. And even because I used to live on just the other side of the motorway over in Saddleworth, which is like 10 miles away, and the climbs are a lot gentler over there. As soon as I started riding here, like, you're in a lower gear because everything is, you can granny ring a lot of the climbs around here and you're still almost at max effort on some of them yeah. if you pick like the steep ones. So if you're going out with a group of people who've been riding and you've met through work or whatever you've, however you've got into it, if your first ride is that, well, that was horrible. Yeah. I'm cold and muddy. I hurt. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've broken my bike. It's cost me whatever. Like, you're not going to, it takes a certain kind of yeah, weirdness yeah. to think, oh, that was great. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. No, it's all good. I think it's all going in the right direction. It gets more people into the sport, more people riding. I don't think there's any, for me, there's no real downside to it, to be honest. Well, it's just when people are like, oh, oh the erosion or all this sort of stuff. And it's yeah. like, well, yeah, but you can't just have you just riding your trek. Like, yeah. you need, everything needs to well it doesn't need to grow but it needs to be sustainable and having more people doing it just means that actually yeah if you want to go more further away from the crowds maybe going to clandagla isn't your ideal place to go for a ride yeah so there'll always be people who are pushing to get more and more away from whatever yeah but actually if it means that like the trail centers you can ride now, the places you can ride in this country compared to 10 years ago, we used to have to go to like Whistler to get a jump, yeah, like a yeah. decent jump. And now you've got all these places to ride and people riding them all the time. So all these people are making money and the industry's booming because of it because there's more people riding. Yeah. Whereas it used to be that there'd be about 300 people who were racing or riding like downhill at a certain level and we'd all just travel around the country doing the different races because yeah. that's the only way you'd get an uplift. Whereas now you don't need to race to get Yeah, an uplift. yeah. So the actual quality of riders is improving. Everything's getting better. Yeah. On that note, what's your thought on um, off-piece trails, shall we call them? So a lot of my local riding, I'm definitely not going to incriminate myself here. <laughs> <laughs> there are some bridleways now there, and uh, there's a lot of, most of the trails around here are built into private woodland which you never see the owner or whatever. Yeah. It's like it's almost abandoned woodland, really, and they're built in, and they're not even footpaths. They are literally just carved into the side of, like side of the the hills my thing about all this sort of stuff is basically a respect thing and it comes down to don't be a dick yeah and i think if you're riding anywhere whether it be a cheeky footpath or a because we used to ride the footpaths on like i'm still where i grew up in Cheltenham for all the time and occasionally you'd get a walker giving you loads of grief and it's like look we're not causing any harm we're just riding the trail and yeah. they're like the erosion i'm like it's a quarry yeah like <laughs> Nothing here is natural. <laughs> like, they've literally nicked half the hill to build those houses. It's not natural. 
but then it was like right okay so it just evolved in they were like well the walkers would have those trails and the cyclists would have these trails and yeah. it was just about being set it's the same round here it's like if you're going to be riding on what is clearly a footpath don't hoon it down at yeah, 300 miles yeah. an hour that's why i quite like riding the short travel bikes because it just slows you down yeah that's true because if you're riding the 160 on a mixed use trail even a bride away yeah i think sometimes the bride are the most dangerous because you could come around a corner and yeah that's true there'd be a group of horses so although that's what you should be on riding something where there isn't anyone else yeah is probably often better but yeah. then equally building massive jumps or skidding onto a road or whatever wherever the conflict could come you've got to realize you're essentially in the wrong so yeah. be aware of that yeah yeah so it's just about finding the right level yeah and not causing too much trouble yeah there's a local it's up barkisland do you know norland more i don't know it but i know about yeah. yeah so that i think that's owned by yorkshire water i think and for the longest time you weren't allowed to cycle up there but it'd just be dog walkers and everybody did you don't really go up there to ride you go up there to get to the other side of it right. and you can either go on the road for three miles or you can kind of cut across the moor and it's like a super super sort of gradual descent so you can like get up to speed and then you can maintain 15 20 mile an hour so it's a lot more fun to get to the other side yeah. but they i think they've been um trying for ages to get it where you could cycle up there and it's just been approved recently oh wow Oh, it's going through, so yeah, that's yeah. really good. But again, up there, like if I was riding up there, you'd you'd see a dog walker and you just you, you stop until yeah, the dog's yeah, kind of got yeah. to you and the dog's gone and then you carry on, don't you? Yeah. I think people who cause the issues are those that see a dog off the lead and then just bomb it and the dog will be chasing yeah, and they yeah, just keep it. pedaling and like it just pisses everyone off yeah, that, doesn't yeah. it? Well, this, I think the Yorkshire Water, because it's the same at Wynn Hill, round by um, right. thing, that was always Yorkshire Water. Oh, okay. And for years, we weren't allowed to do anything there. And then when I went riding there this summer, and it was like, oh my God, there's just loads and loads of trails. And I think it can be down to whoever is the warden of the area that might be a bit more cycling friendly. Yeah. Because the argument was always, well, you can't ride here because the erosion will put um, sediment into the reservoir. Oh, okay. And that was why they didn't want people using the forest. Right. And it's like, well, that sort of makes sense. Yeah. But realistically, you're going to cut all these trees down at some point. It's a managed forest, so you can't be that worried about it. Yeah. And and the amount of like water that must make stuff run into the reservoir. Yeah. I can't imagine a couple of people on bikes yeah. is going to have that. No, much. that's what the thing is. It's just a bit, they're worried about liability and risk and all this kind yeah, of stuff. And then yeah. when it comes down to it, as long as you've got a group that are managing it and doing things well, it makes sense to use these spaces. That's what the countryside is for. It's not wilderness. We don't live in a wilderness. Yeah, yeah so, absolutely, yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting. And I think it's just one of those things that the problem is it can be disrupted by someone causing trouble or yeah. someone building stuff that's just ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. So whether it be Warncliffe or whatever, there's all these places that kind of sort of allowed to use. Yeah. But you just have to be sensible about it. Yeah, of what you do. Yeah. Because yeah. there's a lot of people whose hobby is more digging than riding. Yeah. And that's cool. But I suppose it's just getting the balance right. Yeah. I think you have to be careful as well. It's not as bad now, but in our local woods, particularly in lockdown, I think because more people are riding there, there was, I'm pretty sure I've met the man, but can't confirm it. Um, but there was a guy who was putting out like sticks and stuff like that. But these were at the bottom of some steep shoes yeah, and right. round corners. But a lot of like teenagers go riding there as well. Yeah. And you'd see some of the stuff and it'd be like a rocky shoot where you have to be off the brakes until you get to the bottom. They put like massive like boulders there and stuff like yeah. that. So people like trying to cause harm. So that's where... Well, that's why I think it's the same thing about... In any group or society, you've got an extreme small number of people that are just asses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whether it be walkers or cyclists or horse riders or drivers or whatever it is, and they can give the whole group a bad name. Yeah. Whereas actually, most people are quite happy to share their space and yeah. be nice to each other. Yeah. And you've just got to try and remember that. Actually, yeah, that one person who's trying to kill the cyclist isn't, this, but there's also there's probably a couple of cyclists who like are causing the trouble as well. So yeah. you can just leave them to have their yeah, arguments. Yeah, yeah. And just everyone else getting with things. I think as well, the issue with having like a few not rights or a few wrong ones in a group is that everybody gets kind of like tired for the same yeah, brush. Totally. There was a post recently. So it was on, I think, Rivington Mountain Bike Group, which is over in Bolton. Don't even know why I'm in the group. I'm in loads of groups like that on Facebook. And it was clearly a walker or somebody. Oh no, I remember. So she'd commented into this group basically saying, um, well, the mountain bikers who've been doing donuts in my um, flyer, she have been doing like flowers and this person, someone's been doing donuts in the flower patch. <laughs> and she'd seen someone on what looks to be a mountain bike doing donuts and then obviously any mountain bike straight away is going you can't do yeah, a donut on a mountain bike, bike. Yeah, yeah. you can't do a donut on an e-bike yeah. so i think what it had been is you know like those Suron bikes it had been one of them there'd been young lads going yeah. up probably have been doing donuts in it but then obviously people don't tend to know that they're not mountain yeah, bikers yeah. so she got some really nice responses being like thanks for all your hard work like yeah. i can guarantee that wasn't a mountain bike yeah. though just because it's physically impossible to do a donut mm. um but some people don't don't realize well do there's even people in the bike industry who don't the press as well that call those store and 
mountain yeah, bikes mountain or e-bikes. Bikers, yeah, he's like, yeah, no, yeah. no, it's just an electric motorbike. Just because it's not petrol doesn't mean it's a bicycle. Yeah. So you see things in the press at every level, and it's like the whole industry and the Bicycle Association of people aren't doing enough to educate press and industry and yeah. MPs and all this sort of stuff that yeah, that yeah, yeah. is not a mountain bike. Yeah, have you seen the videos that go viral on Facebook of um, the guys in America doing wheelies into cars and stuff? Yeah. And then if there's a news story about that, they're like road cyclists doing yeah, wheelies down. Yeah. You're like, no, come on, yeah. <laughs> they're not road cyclists, yeah. they're teenagers on bikes. Yeah. Yeah. It's just putting people into it, groups for easily, isn't it? But, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So. So, uh, fly distribution. Yes. <laughs> I've not seen it since then, and I've purposely not asked you any questions about it off camera, although I wanted to. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, 15 years of hard work, and it's done. And, yeah, we shut it down in start of July, so it's still relatively fresh. Um, it was sad for the lads that I've employed because mm. I felt bad that I was basically pulling the plug on it. I was sort of sad because it was ending and I don't know what's next. I still don't know what's next, but it was the time was right. We'd had just too much fighting with red tape, with getting stuff into the country with different brands for a whole variety of different reasons. And when we looked at the numbers and the way the bike industry was going, I was like, it's not sustainable to carry on for the next couple of years at least so I could put my money into it again and try and sustain things but I don't want to I'm done so um yeah after speaking to the accountants and the liquidators and everything else it was like right unless you physically personally fund it right you, you, it's not sustainable all uh, right so we could have taken on well the contract I'd signed with one of the bicycle brands we worked with meant I couldn't do another bicycle brand uh, for 18 months it was kind of like after closing no after closing with them oh okay so i was like well i don't i mean there isn't another bicycle brand oh I've, so after it stops with ktm yeah i don't know if i could say it on yeah that. yeah we can so it's, after it stopped with ktm you had to wait 18 months before taking on another yes oh, part so of the, drops you in it doesn't it yeah yeah but it was partly i'd kind of suggested that as part of the termination agreement okay. it's like a marriage so this is what um the part of the problem was is that there's different agreements whether you're an agent or a distributor or, or what relationship you have and as an agent you are responsible for the territory and you get paid commission on the sales right so essentially when you start off with a brand you're putting all the effort in because there's no sales you've got to build a relationship and that kind of stuff okay and then after a few years it becomes financially sustainable and, and you then, were an agent weren't you yeah for so an agent for know. ktm so after 10 years it had come to a certain sustainable level. It was like, right, we've got a good income from this. And then after the Brexit scenario, it really wasn't working because right. if you're an agent, they ship from the factory in Europe direct to the bike shops. Yeah. So it meant every single one of our dealers became the importer. Yeah. So then they were having to pay import duty, customs clearance fees, oh. Uh, all this kind of... And get a head around it all as well. Yeah, yeah. So it was just a nightmare. Right. And then shipping went from being 48 hours for a bike to a month. Whoa. Sometimes more than that. That big a difference. Oh, oh yeah. Word. It was an absolute nightmare. So when KTM said to us, oh, we want to move to a distributor, I was like, that makes sense. It's fine. I understand. Oh, that. so is that what happened with KTM? Yeah, yeah. Then? So right. I, I, the, basically it was a... We fought for two years to get them to ship the bikes, to do this, to do it. It was just a nightmare. Right. But... When they said we want to be we move to a distributor, I was like, I understand. That right. actually is the solution to all the And problems. then the benefit of them is that the distributor deals with all of the import yeah, and everything. It's one like that. shipment. Right. All that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it did make sense. So I was like, that's fine, no problem at all. We'll have to have this conversation now with the lawyers because it's ending the, the contract. Right. Um as back to the marriage analogy, if you decide, right, I'm leaving my wife because I've got a better offer or I want to change the situation, you there's certain responsibilities you've got in terms of finances and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So we had to argue, discuss, negotiate that end of agreement to right. sort it all out um, to make sure that we were compensated and we got half the house essentially. Oh, uh, okay. Got you. Because they have to buy you out. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah, that took a while to sort out. Uh, okay. But I said to them, look, obviously you don't want me just going to all my dealers next week saying, oh, we're not doing KTM anymore. We're doing 
yeah. brand X or whatever it is. Yeah. Not brand X because that is a brand. Oh, right. So okay. I'll because they to, need to go to the yeah. still so kids business right, with so, the dealer. Yeah. So we'll give you 18 months where right. we won't compete with you. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Because you've got KTM dot of the relationship. You have the relationship yeah. with the, with the with dealers. The uh, okay. Yeah. So you could essentially take a lot of yeah. their custom. Yeah, if, just, if it was a new brand. Yeah. So I was like, we don't want to be competing with you. Yeah. So that's part of the termination agreement is that you negotiate something that it means you aren't going to do it. So yeah. Yeah. Got you. There's a lot more interesting stuff, but I won't say all of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that ended um, uh, middle of the year. So it was a situation where we can't do another bike brand. The component brands we've got won't sustain the costs we've got. There's all kinds of problems uh, with the component brands we're doing in terms of getting stuff into the UK. I am tired and I'm done. Yeah. yeah. So it was like, right, this is the right time. Yeah. So essentially I was almost made redundant by my own yeah. company. Yeah. Got but you. I've been made redundant before and it was the best thing that ever happened. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. I suppose before you can't do anything new, can you? Because all of your energy is going into that. And if it's not, if it's not growing or if it's doing the opposite, if it's shrinking and it's causing you all that stress, but then you can't get out of it, can you either? So yeah. you're absolutely stuck. You've just got to keep, keep grinding, haven't you? Yeah. It just got to a point where I just was every email from everybody was just negative. Yeah. Just a fight. And yeah. it was just like getting, trying to get stuff into the UK chasing the couriers, arguing with people about, well, you've just done this wrong. Nothing was straightforward. It was no, there was no joy yeah. with it. So uh, being in the middle of a supply chain is never an easy situation. I always have to say to the lads that we are, if there was no problems, we wouldn't be needed. Yeah, They just sell to them. Yeah, The same yeah. way if you're a bicycle brand, you can yeah, sell direct to the customer or you can sell to a distributor or yeah. you can sell to the shop. Whichever avenue you decide to go to, there's problems and solutions with that. So we were in the middle. So we are just solving problems. Yeah. Otherwise, we wouldn't they be wouldn't, needed. Yeah, that makes sense. The bike shop would just go to it. Yeah, so, but then that's not out. very fun, is it? If it's getting, not not necessarily getting worse, but if it's getting more oh, and more problems. Just, and... Yeah. Customers, a lot of the bike shops that we've sold to, I would consider friends. We dealt with them for years and having to say to them, look, I honestly can't give you I can't give you a date. Yeah, yeah. When I, I know it's been shipped. Yeah. But I can see it. Yeah. And also in some cases, they paid for it because yeah. they pay pro forma. So I'm like, yeah, I, I don't know where it is. And I'd have to ask the supplier, whichever one of the suppliers you're working with, I'm like, I don't know when they're coming. And then equally, you know that the supplier, and this is not just a bike industry problem, I know this from other people I know in other industries that work. If you are a supplier in Europe and you've got a fridge or a bicycle or a whatever it is, you've made and you've like oh we've made 50 this today brilliant do you want to sell those 50 to easy markets that involve next yeah, day shipping of course, yeah. or do you want to sell it to the uk and have all the hassle and yeah. a month of things and all this sort of stuff and if you've got demand yeah, from your, yeah. the existing if you've markets, already sold the 50 if you've yeah, sold 100 yeah. and you've only got 50 yeah, yeah. You're gonna sell so every time ones. any of our suppliers or any of these other people i knew were making stuff there's like oh come on send ours send ours and it's just hard to get people mm. to, to to prioritize a market that is just a nightmare to get to. So yeah, we just were struggling on every every front. And I was just like, I'm just this is the time. It's been like I've had a good run at it. I've enjoyed it. We worked with a lot of great brands, and I know the bike industry when we could see it coming a way off right. in terms of the problems with the, the sort of this couple of years we're in the middle of. It wasn't a surprise yeah. to anybody. So it was like right. I don't want to be taking on new brands. Like if you go into a bike shop now trying to sell them stuff, you can't even get them to take stuff that they've already ordered. Right. Let alone go, here's me with a new bike brand. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Is that so as much as I understand that from being very much out of it, really, like I'm in the bike industry, but then I'm not involved in the industry side of it, like yeah. at all. So the way I understand it is that there was a massive amount of demand in COVID. So all of the brands ordered as much as they possibly could, but then, and then everything was selling out. But then I'm right in thinking then there was a big lag between a lot of that stuff actually getting delivered. So demand has dropped off and now a lot of brands are kind of over, a lot of uh, shops are over supplied. Yeah. Is that right or not? It's basically right. It's, um, I hadn't really realized how you know, greedy is the wrong word, but we, we sat in our little warehouse, the sort of four of us who were working at Fly and were like, right, this is not sustainable. Yeah. And I didn't want to be the guy who- This was is sat, in COVID. This is in COVID times. Yeah. yeah. You're like, right. At some point it's going to drop off. Yeah. And I don't want to be the guy who sat on 50 e-bikes or 5,000 e-bikes, whatever your level yeah, is yeah. on that day. <laughs> So yeah. we were always like, right, we're not going to take on any more staff. We're not going to order loads of stuff. We're just yeah. going to sit on things and try and manage it right. And then when the obvious decline happened, and it's twofold because 
it's the decline because everyone's got a bike, so no one needs a bike. So that was yeah. obviously gonna gonna happen. Yeah. And then also no one's got any money now. And as well, some of the people just weren't a lot of people got into cycling, but they weren't cyclists or mountain yeah. bikers at the time, and then some of those will carry on, but then a lot of them won't. Yeah, yeah. A so lot all those of people have them sat in the garage. Yeah. yeah. So the, it's like a threefold. Yeah, like all these yeah. reasons why it clearly wasn't gonna be sustainable. So yeah. now all these people are selling second hand bikes, all this sort of stuff, it didn't result in loads of new customers. It was all obviously gonna happen. What I hadn't really anticipated, and it was only speaking to some people I know in the industry, was how much of the bike industry was controlled by people looking at numbers, not on the ground. So there's a lot of bike brands now that are owned, or bike shops even, that are owned by private equity and big money, like pension fund, that kind of stuff. It's like big, proper money, and they're part of a portfolio of businesses. So... Lots of bike shops during COVID and just after COVID were being sold because the bike industry was the thing. So Les Lakes got sold, Wheelbase got sold, Evans went bust and then got took over by Mike Ashley. Right. Chain Reaction and Wiggle merged and then got bought by someone else. It's all been moving around. And that was because the bike industry was exploding in a yeah. good way. Like it was just going wild. Okay. Yeah. So all these companies were investing in cycling and yeah. buying the bike shops. And bike brands were looking at, like, if I don't order this Stram stuff, it's like a four-year lead time. I'm not going to be able to get it. And then shops were doing like, well, if I don't order these bikes, I'm not going to be able to get them. And also shops were thinking, right, if I've done X this year, I need to show my investors that I can do 2X next year. Yeah. So there was all this stuff going on that was just building this bubble of expectation, yeah, yeah. which wasn't realistic. It wasn't and founded on anything, Yeah, yeah. It? So anybody at any level, all like the reps and everybody who's actually on the ground was yeah. like, well, I can't sell more bikes than last year. Like, it's obvious I'm not going to be able to sell more bikes uh, than last year. But then the investors will look at the number and, and go, just right. think, yeah. they just thought it was natural that the industry yeah. was going that way. Yeah, and also people who were trying to sell their businesses were telling the investors, oh yeah, look what we did last year. Uh, so we can do okay. this this year. So because you like would, a, because you get more money yeah, now, yeah. wouldn't you? So it was like a self-perpetuating <laughs> bubble of growth that was underpinned by nothing. Right. So now you've got all these factories in the Far East who've helped push that rush to sell stuff because they were like, right, if you don't order now, you don't get anything. Yeah. So they were making the bike brands order components and parts. Bike brands were like, well, if we don't do it, we aren't going to get the growth. Our shops are telling us they want stuff. Yeah. Our distributors are telling us they want stuff because they were all trying to get... But they want stuff yeah. now and for the next two or three months. Yeah, don't yeah. They? So yeah. now suddenly the shops are going, no, we don't want anything. So the distributor's like, well, maybe we don't want it. But the factories are saying, no, you can't cancel because we've ordered the raw materials. Right. So it's all in a downward spiral. And different levels of bike shop and distributors have got different problems. If you need to sell a huge number of bikes to cover your costs yeah. and the bike sales have just died, yeah. then you aren't going to get the money from servicing. Whereas some smaller bike shops will be like, well, we'll be fine because we just get money from servicing. Yeah. Or we only have to sell like a small number of bikes. It's mm. just bonus money. So it's going to be a traumatic uh, time. So have bike sales in the industry in general significantly dropped off recently then? I mean, you would imagine that they have, but again, I don't have access to any kind I of numbers. I haven't seen or... the numbers recently, but I would anticipate based on what I've seen is that imagine, let's say it was a thousand bikes a year. I mean, it's obviously not. It's like, yeah, yeah. It's not, but let's say a thousand bikes a year pre-COVID. Yeah. And then it went to 4,000 bikes a year. Is that what kind of growth Yeah, it was, it was insane. Like Whoa. every shop just sold out. Yeah. So there was I remember no going bikes. to Leisure Lakes and on yeah. two floors there was nothing on yeah. either. It was wild. And there's yeah. normally a thousand bikes that it gets yeah, yeah. in there. So it was insane the number of bikes sold. So basically everything that anyone would normally make sold. So yeah. it, whatever doubled, whatever it was, it was insane. And then now we've gone down to like 700. But the supply is still at 3,000 or whatever it is. Oh, yeah. God. So they're being pushed on the market that wants less bikes than before. Right, Okay. So now they're discounted everywhere. So now is the if you can afford to buy a bike, now Now's is the, the time, time to buy it? a bike. Yeah yeah, 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 because they will never get a good bargain as you will do now. Yeah. But what companies survive this next year or two will be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of glad I'm not having to yeah go through any of that now yeah it must be nice now to be able to sit back and watch it i know you don't want that you'll have a lot of friends in the industry so you don't want to see anybody struggling but it must be nice to now be out of it yeah to to have it was always like i'm having to pay to employ people and it's my essentially every penny was like my money doing this so now it's not my responsibility i sleep a lot easier yeah i can imagine um so that's a lot nicer in terms of not having to worry about Right, we need to do this amount of sales to cover these costs. Mm. It's fine if it's just yourself. I mean, you can you can cope with a bit of flex. Yeah. But it was always hard having sub agents and stuff that on just staff that were employed. Yeah. That was a tricky time. So I'm I'm 
happy about that. And there's been a few, I've spoken to a lot of reps who I know at various different shows or out in the Alps and stuff. And they're always like, well, you timed that well, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I have been lucky. It's always, people who know me have always said that I'm lucky with this sort of stuff. Like I, years ago, I got my world ranking points for racing downhill. And I was like, right, get my world ranking points before I can go off racing. Got into work on the Monday morning and they were like, we need to make two people redundant. If you volunteer, we'll give you some extra cash. Oh. <laughs> so I'm like, right, sign me up. So that's the sort of thing. So with this as well, it was like, it couldn't have been better time. Yeah, of course. So I am very lucky. Yeah. And I could have, yeah. I mean, it was horrible, but my dad died last year. It was awful time. Yeah. But I got a bit of money from that. And I could, it, it very, it would have been very easy for a different circumstances for me to have thrown that money at fly. fly yeah. And then in a year's time being like, oh, well, that was a waste. Yeah, of course. So I didn't want to do that. Um, so it, walking away, I've got a bit of time to just breathe and see what I want to do. And some point next year, have a think. Yeah. Because um, yeah, the bike industry is in a dark place. I mean, all yeah. this is about chain reaction and wiggle over the weekend. Is yeah, like, yeah wild and it won't be the last so we'll definitely talk about chain reaction and wiggle in a second how was it telling the guys how were they because obviously i know quite a few of them yeah it was i don't think a surprise well it obviously wasn't a surprise they had a feeling it was coming yeah because from november yeah. they'd known that we were stopping with ktm right okay so so they're already asking questions about yeah it. yeah we all i mean it was like it, and also clearly when i'm saying don't bother coming in like it's fine i'll still yeah. pay you but yeah. there's nothing to do it yeah, just makes yeah. me stressed and you stressed if you're here not doing anything yeah so it was obvious but then i was it was the decision i had to say to him look I'm, i can't put any more of my money in to this um just to keep us all ticking along ticking along as a hobby basically yeah. to do stuff. so yeah we sat well then it's not really ticking along is it it's no, putting money it's just in and then me, the money's just, just going down yeah, the drain yeah it would just be a a vanity project mm. from me to keep my so sort of be like yeah i managed to keep my company going for another couple of years mm. And I'd got to the point where I was like, yeah. So we sat in the warehouse, had a beer, and it was sad. But I hope that in, even in six months' time, they're all like, yeah, that was the right decision. Yeah. yeah. They'll be better for it. Yeah. They're all good lads who have got good skills and will make the best of it. Yeah. And they're all young as well. So, yeah, that's why I always, I mean, you're not 50 a, with a mortgage with yeah. this and that and the other, or 40 with like two yeah. young kids. Like, as far as I know, none of them have kids. So. Yeah. It was, it was a conscious decision of mine from day one with Fly, really, is that I didn't want the stress of having, oh, uh, it was always like, right, I'll take like it. That. yeah, it was uh, basically, I was right. a, a sanctuary for ex students. Right. For, okay. For 10 years, all in Manchester and over this uh, way. It was like, right, anyone wants to come and have a job for a couple of years after you finish university work at when you do it life you never have to pay retail price for bike stuff right when i had the house in in steady bridge people used to live with me and yeah. then work for the days and that sort of stuff so it was always like right this isn't going to be super serious and i've got the flexibility from that and that was always the strategy because uh, okay. i just didn't i'm like i am not about finding stress yeah, so I, didn't yeah. do. I didn't want to have someone's like mortgage and kids and yeah, everything else it, yeah. as my uh on my plate yeah so, yeah. I can totally relate to that because I, as I've always, I'd say scared of employing people from a couple of reasons. I think but I'm, I'm a very sociable person, but I'm also, I'm, a, I'm a cross between like an extrovert and an introvert. Really, I'm a bit of both, so I can sit and have this conversation and be very extroverted. But then if I was to do all day every day being with people, like I need yeah. a bit of my own time as well. So most of my time is on my laptop on my own, and but then I really thrive off also having some connection. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, but the thought of managing a team. I find scary. Sophie's amazing at it. Sophie, my wife, sounds weird saying that. She, <laughs> um, she's a manager at school. Uh, she's on the senior leadership team. And I've seen her with like essentially her staff, people yeah. who are under her, though that's not the right phrase. And she just, she's a natural with yeah. it. Like someone will say something and inside I'm like, oh, what a stupid thing to say. <laughs> and then Sophie's like, no, no, don't worry. Like, da, 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 da. And she'll, she'll listen to them for half yeah. an hour. And inside I'm kind of twitching. Like I the I'm sure I would be okay at it, but I don't think I'll ever do it. There's that side of it. But then the other side of it that I find terrifying is what you've just said, which is the thought of having to support everybody else's mortgages. Yeah, yeah. Like anybody who I've worked with, like Zach, who's doing this podcast and the video, I'm one of his clients, but he has other clients yeah, yeah. and it's on a self-employed basis. So I know that if anything happened to me, they've got other people supporting yeah, yeah. them. Um, so yeah, I can, it's, you've got to be brave. Like, I think it's brave anyway, taking on students and whatnot, but yeah. you've got to be really brave. I think to 
get a business and then have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 employees because yeah, yeah. the book lands on you. Like, Well, that was always with how I wanted, where I wanted it to be because you, you kind of have a bit of control of these things. So it was always like, do I want to be a distributor who's doing 30 brands and all this kind of stuff? Or do I, am I happy having four or five that turns over at this level? That means we all have a good standard of living. We can have a laugh. We can go yeah. ride bikes and do that sort of stuff. And I was like, actually, I'm happy at this level. Yeah. So never made huge amounts of money, never lost huge amounts of money, never got too bad. And whether that, well, that was fine. That was what I wanted from the yeah, business. Yeah, yeah. So it was it was a decision-making process to try and keep things at that level. Yeah. Um, because there's, yeah, you can risk lots yeah. and have more stress. Yeah. Um, but I liked being able to have days where, yeah, it was days in the workshop building stuff or I would actually do go and do some rep work or do this and do that. I quite like being able to get my hands dirty and do stuff without yeah. having to employ someone. It was like to do those things. Yeah, yeah, got you. So yeah, we did have a team, like it was essentially a web guy accounts people. You have all this sort of stuff that was separate. Yeah. But that was again, employing other firms or individuals to handle the different skill sets that they were doing yeah so that we could just focus on the bikes. yeah rather than having it all in-house yeah because sometimes i did think right i need to employ an accounts person and it was like actually no i don't because we just need to send the invoices and then i can get like a bookkeeper to do that and yeah, an accounts yeah. team to do that and yeah so yeah it was all right yeah and i think now especially with the internet as it is you don't i imagine what, 30 years ago 40 years ago you probably had to have everything in-house didn't you yeah. whereas now with the way the internet is like i'm the same like you got an accountant and a bookkeeper so Everything just automatically goes from the website to yeah. zero. I have no idea how to use zero. No idea. I'll yeah, open yeah, it up and I'll like, the hell is this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just have to go on every now and again and then just approve things and then they take care of that side of it. So it makes all that a lot easier. I think now you can do it that yeah. way, can't you? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So you obviously, you don't know what you want to do next. No. You must have thoughts bouncing around in your head. Yeah, yeah. I've, I mean, I love the bike industry, but... The, I got into it really through the racing and it was just a way to, it just spiraled. So now I've got an opportunity to just stand back and look at things. It's mm. like, well, I could do what I do in the bike industry in another industry quite easily. Yeah. And I'd be rewarded a lot better. Right. I mean, the, the sort of skill set and the, it's like account manager, territory manager, operations, supply chain, all this sort of stuff, all the skill sets that you yeah. build up are like, well, actually that works in anything. It doesn't have to be bikes. So, I could be in bikes, but the bike industry is on its knees. So do I want to get into that at the moment? And also the advantage of getting discounted stuff, like I'm probably not going to need that for quite a while because I know everybody anyway. So I'm still going to be able to take advantage of that. I've got 18 months until my wife finishes a PhD or well, two years. So what I do for that time, and then we could go anywhere, anywhere in the world. Really. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I just want to make sure I'm flexible for that. I've got a teaching degree. I've got a master's in environmental stuff. So I could go back into either of those things if I wanted to. Yeah, yeah. you got loads of options. Yeah. Well, I've signed up for a few of the sort of alerts and stuff, and every day it's like, there's 28 new jobs. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I need one, but I'm quite happy. So do you fancy going employed rather than self? Because as far as I know, you've always been self-employed, is I've that been, right? No, I was, um, oh, right. when I did my master's, I was a consultant for about three years. Okay. Being employed, and then got made redundant and went racing. Oh, you said. And then when I came back from racing, I went and did a teaching qualification so that I could still race in the summers and things. Okay. So I, then I taught for a year. All right. And then fly took off that I couldn't commit to being a full-time teacher. Right, so okay. I've had two sort of paid-ish yeah. careers. But again, that was probably only six years of actual paid jobs since I was working in bike shops as a kid. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I'm ready to just have a steady wage. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah. It's quite exciting. Um, so yeah, I've, I've, yeah, I'm, I'm done being the responsible person for everybody else for a bit in terms of actual money. Yeah. I quite want to do something interesting that motivates me, that challenges me that yeah, I that get you can use your skill from. set for. Yeah. Use all that and do it for someone that I don't have to fight with. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah it's just yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, just do something that's actually um, enjoyable that I enjoy going to work. Cause it's so easy now to have something that's like half remote, half office based, be part of a team somewhere that does something that is proactively building something, whether it's looking after racing. I don't really want to be sales. I've never really been a sales guy. I've always been, do you want to buy something? I'll yeah. help you get it. Yeah, type. Yeah. And that relationship and knowing the right people to help make things happen. Yeah. So there's loads of industries that do that sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just keeping an eye out. Wrote a CV for the first time in 30 years. <laughs> that was strange. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it'll be spring. I start looking really. Yeah. Um, yeah, the winter, of, I've got a lot of jobs to sort out and... Um, just ride some bikes and try and get fit and then yeah, yeah. see what happens yeah 
something will come up. Yeah. Oh, 100% something yeah. will come up. Yeah, yeah. And I think as well, when you've got time to sort of like think and be calm, you've got a better idea what direction you want to go in, haven't you? Yeah. Whereas everything's so crazy, you can't really think the same, can you? You're just reacting rather than being proactive. So I yeah. think you need that break to decide what you want to do next. Yeah. I'm in a lucky position. I mean, it's a very privileged that I am not desperate. Yeah. I mean, I'm sat on enough that I don't need to worry about things. And yeah, could be a situation where I'd have to work for a couple of years, but yeah. I don't want to do that because I don't want to get to the end of a couple of years and be like, oh, well, that, like I've just frittered that away. Yeah, of course. I'd much rather keep that safe for next house and just find something that is is right next year. Yeah. Um, that that fits in with the, the skill set. And also if, it, if it's two years and then I move abroad or move to somewhere else with Louise. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just got me another different yeah, of sort of pack of stuff. So. Yeah, exciting times. Yeah, that's One it. Door closes. Uh, yeah, yeah. I my wife does not cope well with uncertainty. Oh, okay. Whereas I, so I bet she's really, very calm at the moment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's like, but it's like we don't need to worry. And, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, the certainty is having knowing that you're safe for X amount of time. Yeah, yeah. That and I can tell the other thing is I could just literally go and be a supply teacher. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? I've got the qualifications. I've got experience. I can just go and do that. So yeah. there's about there's about ten things that I know I could just walk yeah, into yeah. if I wanted to. Yeah. Um. So we're we're I'm in a very lucky position. Yeah, so. yeah. So chain reaction cycles and wiggle. So I bet things are evolving faster. It's the 23rd at the minute. So the news broke last week, didn't it? That they were going into administration. Self. You'll understand a lot more of this well, than I yeah, do because I, I know there's administration and then one of the other businesses owned by them has gone into actual insolvency. Is that right? So am I right in thinking that's when you break up the business? Yeah, well, sort of. I There's people I know who work for them that are still saying it's not affecting them. Right. So what's been published online about wiggle chain reaction seems fairly certain and it's even the press release from the german company that owns them saying that they are going into self-administration which essentially protects you from your creditors shutting you down yeah so you can try and work out what it does now it basically means yeah we're not solvent yeah they've had signa not sigma sigma's a different company sigma sport who's this bike company but sigma who own wiggle chain reaction are a German company and their parent company is huge, which is another Cigna something. Right. And the German parent company is gone. You're not having the credit money. So it now means that the small Cigna, which owns Chain Reaction and Wiggle, yeah. and a load of other, they own some massive tennis thing in Europe and stuff, basically isn't solvent. So right. can't afford to trade. Okay. So they're trying to work out what they do, which is usually get sold, strip some assets, do whatever it is that does it, that either makes it carry on or stops. Yeah. And I think they're at that point now. Okay. So what do you think is going to happen then? Do you think they're going to disappear or do you think they're going to get bought out? Or Because there are like, for, there'll be people listening to this in America and whatnot. I don't think you have chain reaction cycles and wiggle over there. I don't think. But here, like it's the the biggest name, isn't oh, it it's, really? It's, it's the global. name. Like, oh, it's massively global. Yeah. Like, oh, is it? Yeah, yeah. I've, I know people who work for some brands. Yeah. I won't name the brands for a variety of reasons but that Wiggle sell more of their product to the Southern Hemisphere than they do. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, as a brand. Right. Oh, so they are global. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally didn't realize. Global. I thought yeah, it was yeah. just UK. There's people, if you look on some of the, because I've been obviously keeping it because I've not got a job, I've just been nosing around what's going on. <laughs> so um, yeah, some of the forums for like Road CC and some of the bike industry forums, the people who are commenting are like, oh, I used to get all my stuff from them and I'm in New Zealand. Right. It's the only okay. place I could get stuff in Australia. Oh, uh, right. And they obviously ship loads of stuff to Europe as well right. when it was dead easy to ship to Europe. So I can see that there's a load of people affected by it. And even like I've been into like most bike shops over the past couple of years and there's always a chain reaction box underneath the cabinet because yeah. they're like, oh, it's quite, they're, I don't know, some forks were on clearance or whatever it was and they'd buy stuff. Yeah. So it's been a, they've been a supplier to the bike industry as well. It's because that's strange, isn't it? Because I'm in, I think only one Facebook group that's like a bike industry group. It's like bike shop owners. And a lot of them, they were saying that chain reaction cycle will often be cheaper than the supplier which is bonkers. So if you're buying a Shimano, you know, Derailleur or whatever, it's cheaper to get it from Chain Reaction Cycles than it is to get it from the supplier or the distributor, yep. which is wild, isn't it? Yeah. So do they get it direct from Shimano? Is that why? There's all kinds of supply chains. So I remember speaking to one of the buyers at Wiggle, this is like eight years ago, and he was saying for our product, they had um, seven different suppliers for that one product of that one brand. Oh, wow. And they had a couple were in the UK, a couple were in Europe, and then a few were in the Far East. Oh, okay. So at any point, they're buying from anywhere that will sell into that product. So right. whether it be a clearance from a German bike shop that's gone bust or a bike brand that's ordered way too many XTMX uh, and, they needs, to get rid of and they needs to get rid of them uh, or the factory in the Far East. I've heard a story, this is a while ago, and again, I won't name the brand, that they were making 
um, components and they were quite a high-end component brand and they made, let's say, a thousand sets of these components and they turned up on Chain Reaction. So the brand were not happy because they were like, which distributor sold them? So they went around all the distributors and none of the distributors would admit to selling these components to Chain Reaction. And then they found out that the factory in the Far East had made a thousand for the bike brand <gasps> and they made another thousand oh, and sold them direct to Chain Reaction. Oh, no. So there's all this stuff about ownership of things. And that's why when you're getting stuff manufactured in the Far East, it can get subbed out to a different factory or it Whoa. can get like, so that's why the brand ownership and the copyrights, that's why things just turn up. You're like, where do these come from? And it's like, oh yeah, they made extra ones. <laughs> so that's happened. So there's all kinds of things that just Oh, it's so up. much more complicated. Than oh yeah, yeah. So the, the, the as a bike brand, you'll order your OEM, so original equipment, spec, whatever it is, seat posts, whatever it is you've ordered. So you might plan to build half a million bikes like ktm okay. are building five hundred thousand bikes a year now a lot of those bikes will have the same seat posts so yeah. they'll be ordering i don't know hundred thousand seat posts and then something might happen i don't know covid happens and you can't open your factory for three months so you're not building any of those bikes but you've got these hundred thousand seat posts yeah yeah so they'll sell them in a variety of ways right. to a variety of different things so then sometimes you'll buy something from chain reaction or just come in a clear plastic bag right or it'll come in an actual box or they'll be making a loss on it uh, okay just because they want to get rid of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, just because right, they want to get well. rid of some stuff. Or it's like, well, actually, if we, if we do a loss leader with this, it will get loads of people signed up. We've got their email address, and then yeah. we can market them yeah. the other stuff. Now, obviously, selling stuff at a loss or at a very small margin isn't necessarily a hugely long-term business model yeah. unless your strategy is build up sales so that we can sell the company yeah. to someone like Cigna. Uh, okay, got So, it. Jamie Action got sold from the original bike shop that it was to this huge investment bank uh, based on the amount of money they were making. Uh, right. They were only working like 8% profit margin. Right. So okay. it only takes that flipping to suddenly you're losing 97 million quid a year. Yeah, got you. And it's not sustainable. Yeah. yeah. So it, on the supply chain, it's amazing and super interesting and really way too complicated. Oh, for, it's way more than I thought. Yeah. I had no... In, in my head, you have, let's just say Yeti. You have Yeti and then they sell the bikes to Silverfish and then they sell the bikes to the shop. There's way more layers, isn't yeah. there? <laughs> so it's... I mean, there's that's how it should work. Yeah. And then you've got all this stuff that obviously Yeti are buying the frames from the manufacturer in the Far East. I don't know if Yeti own their own factory in the Far East. They, I'm not sure they might do, but they used to make them in America and now they're making the Far East. And you've got all this sort of stuff and then it only takes one unscrupulous factory to be like oh let's start making neck hangers or whatever yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then suddenly the supply chain's chaos yeah. or the distributor in Asia will be like actually we've bought way too many whatever it is let's see if we can sell them into Europe right got you and then that has a knock on effect on everybody yeah. on prices and everything yeah. then doesn't it oh it's wild isn't it it goes so much deeper than I think anybody out of it yeah yeah because realizes. it used to be that um in a way, it was dead straightforward. Like a bike shop would buy something off the rep who came in yeah. and that'd be fine. And then the availability in the internet obviously improved people's level of communication. So the fact that Wiggle had buyers in four continents trying to get the best price they could get stuff, suddenly it meant that your little average bike shop, because we used to go to them as agents for some German, say like, well, you're buying Shimano from Madison. Like, obviously that's the traditional way to buy it. But the reason that Merlin and Chain Reaction, everyone can... Like the reason that sometimes the reason that they can undercut you is because they bought it a lot cheaper. And that's yeah. not necessarily because they're buying loads more, they get a better price. It's because they're buying off someone different. Right. So there's all these different ways of buying stuff that as a consumer, you not have access to. You don't have to just go to your local bike shop. Yeah. And it's the same with the bike shop. It doesn't have to just go to the traditional distributor. Yeah. So it causes all kinds of problems. Yeah, yeah. Especially when you've got a company who are managing the warranty system. Yeah. And that's yeah. what you didn't buy off us. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard because you see it kind of from both sides of you. Because then obviously from the bike shops, you, you want bike shops to be in business. Of course you do. But then as a consumer, you're just going to go on the internet and buy it cheapest. Especially like if it's a component. Like I the warranty issues, I get that. Like yeah. who do you go to? But then I would, I could be wrong with this, but I imagine if I bought a derailleur from Shimano on Chain Reaction Cycles, presumably my warranty would be directly with Shimano, would it? Your warranty is always with the person you bought it off. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. Okay, see, I wouldn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So wherever you buy something, there you warranty. Oh, uh, right. Now, okay. in some cases, they'll be like, oh, yeah, there's a tech center that manages stuff in this country. So as long as you show your receipt, you can get it dealt with by them. Right. But your warranty, your contract is with the person you uh, bought it. Oh, right. Okay. So that's why there's always kind of uh, right. a relatively straightforward system. But then other br brands have different ways of doing things. Yeah, I got you. So, yeah, so that's essentially how it should work. Yeah.
So what's your prediction then? Of, nobody knows what's going to happen. Do you think Chain Reaction Cycles and Wiggle are going to disappear? Do you think they're going to close it down and start up under a new name, if that's possible? I think the or... name will be bought and it will be Mike Ashley or someone like that. So you think that in two years' time, we'll still be able to buy stuff from Wiggle and Chain Reaction at a cheap price? It'll just be everything that goes on behind the scenes that we won't really see? Yeah, the wear it'll all be warehouse in the same warehouse as, I don't know, Will Bates or Leslie Lakes or Evans or someone. John yeah, I got you. The same way House of Fraser now doesn't exist and Debenhams doesn't exist. It's yeah. all just a website that's the same company as somewhere else. Okay, It'll I'm be with you. like that. I yeah, suspect. yeah. Um, because I know a load of guys who run bike shops who've been like, oh, this is brilliant for the for us because these customers will come back to the bike shops. Like, nah. No, they won't. Like, those customers, if you're buying online from Chain Reaction and they haven't got the XT Mech or whatever it is you want in, yeah. you go to the next Yeah, Google of course, you do just scroll across, across like, don't you? Oh, right, it's Winston Stanley's or Merlin or yeah, whatever yeah. it is. You're buying off them. Yeah. You're not going to be like, oh, yeah. well, that's the internet ruined. I'll have to <laughs> yeah. wander down to this, like, yeah, drive yeah. three miles, find somewhere to park, walk into a bike shop. Oh, you haven't got one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, okay. So that customer is going to use that mode of purchase. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah doesn't matter you've got that's we we used to with a certain number of brands we worked with over the years it was like you don't need multiple people online selling stuff you just need a couple yeah because they're all competing for the same customer yeah then you need someone in each town selling stuff because yeah. they're competing for a different customer um but the fight on the internet because you can we have we've worked with websites for years and it's like you just you look on a monday like why haven't we sold any of those we sold loads last week and it's like oh we've been undercut by a penny right, right. <laughs> undercut by a penny and you're like oh we've sold loads again yeah, yeah so some stuff has not got the brand loyalty or the customer loyalty that i think some people yeah think it has there's just a run of the mill right i just buy off those guys because i've got the website saved yeah but yeah 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 i i i can't see the likes of Wiggle Chain Reaction. I mean, I don't even know how the relationship with Hotlines because Chain Reaction is Hotlines, which is Nuke Proof, which is Vitus, which is Brand X. All these brands are all in that wheelhouse. Yeah. Not just, and then they distribute loads of brands as well. And then there's all the reps and stuff. I, it's just a chaotic system. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know what. Happens. Yeah. It sounds like it's like you say, it's just going on. There's going to be a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes and selling and this and that and the other. But then for the customer, probably stay pretty similar, won't it? I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. There's not suddenly, I mean, there's going to be a situation like, do you know, do you know about More Large when they went bust? No, I saw probably... it on Facebook, but I don't know very so much more about Large that. More Large are probably the fourth biggest distributor of oh, bike wow. stuff in the UK. Okay. Yeah. I'm certain they're top five in terms of turnover and that kind of stuff. They did more, not so much mountain bikey stuff, so they wouldn't have got on your radar quite as yeah. much. But they did um, quite a lot of big brands and a lot of bike shops bought off them. And they went bust in February, right, the start of this year. And then 2Pure went as well, which is a Scottish one who did Moustache and a few other bike brands. So they, there's like, I mean, we were small fry compared to those guys. But yeah, so there's, there's already been a number of distributors going. And then there's shops, the same thing as well. But the stuff that they supplied whether it be whatever it was the brand they're doing unless they own the brand yeah. so more large's own in-house brand was form okay. so they're quite big e-bikes and kids bikes and that kind of stuff so that has gone yeah. essentially i don't know if anyone's bought the brand name or whatever but all the brands they distributed whether it be e13 or they did a brand of well they don't know right oh yeah. yeah so yeah. all those brands are like well okay we can't use these guys they got we'll someone, do someone else. else yeah yeah so i think they did, oh, they did turn e-bikes right so within a couple of weeks it turns out the guy who was i don't know if it was turned but whichever brand it was you find out oh the product the, whoever the brand manager was working for distributor x yeah is now looking after the brand on his own yeah handling okay. the import for that sort of stuff got you so it doesn't really change for the end consumer unless you're super into the bike brand that happens to be owned but then you'll find i suspect someone will buy the form brand name yeah and that brand will appear yeah got you because like new proof new proof was a component brand in the 90s for like high-end american super nice carbon stuff disappeared for 10 years and we were at the world masters and the lads from chain reaction i was like oh new proof hubs where have you got them from they're like oh we bought the brand oh wow. so new proof is now chain reaction yeah, yeah and then at some point someone else will buy it to do something else so yeah. i don't know what will happen but i i can't see those brand names disappearing they're too valuable yeah. 
what will happen is someone will buy the company for because it's obviously got x amount of debt yeah someone's going to buy it for two quid yeah pay off the debt have all the stock yeah and then yeah. for the next five years they're making loads of profit because they've essentially got all this stock for free oh, of course but yeah. they've had to take on all the costs yeah i'm with you yeah so that's what happened with evans is suddenly all these all these bikes started flooding the market and it's like how can they sell on that price as well because yeah. they paid two for it. Yeah. <laughs> okay that makes sense it's all change, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it is. And it's always a state of flux. Any industry, there's always churn with businesses because everyone's like, oh, we can make loads of money. So they invest too much and it's not sustainable. So then they go pop and it stuff floods the market cheap because that's where all the stuff comes from. It's like yeah. now there's loads of things on the someone website that is the auction house that's doing more large. So they're just flooding the market with cheap stuff. Um, so all that stuff appears from somewhere and then people buy it and then other people buy that to sell it on again. Yeah, yeah. There's loads of shops buying that stock because yeah, yeah. they're getting it super cheap. Yeah. So that'll just appear in the marketplace. And the same thing will happen if Chain Reaction Wiggle do go. All that stock in the warehouse will either be bought by someone en masse or it'll be auctioned off to play off the creditors. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that the high street bike shop will disappear? Before you answer, I think that you'll have kind of your Leisure Lake size who seem to be big enough where they can stock a load of bikes and people buy bikes off them. Personally, I think your small, independently run bike shop that's in, if you're local to me, Hebden Bridge or Sorby Bridge or whatever, all the local ones, I can see them always existing for the mechanic side of it and for the workshop because someone's always going to need to go to it. But being very disconnected from it, I don't see it being sustainable making any money from selling parts, except for if you're on a bike route and you need inner tubes and chains and stuff like the one at the bottom of clan degler for example they're probably always going to do some kind of business because you turn up and you forgot your helmet or you forgot your shoes or you forgot this you'll buy some i think the ones in sh local villages i can't see being sustainable selling bits but again i'm very much disconnected from it i think you're right i think you only have to go germany is the example that a lot of people use because it's five years ahead okay. of the uk into the marketplace All right. and if you are buying a bike in germany now pretty much the shops are like they're insane they've got like test tracks inside Whoa. it's just massive but they do all the bike brands right and everything's on finance available it's like buying a car right it's like sort of size showroom it's insane Whoa. Right? so when i bring bike brand owners or whatever over to this country they're like what's this <laughs> what? just like antiquated weird way of doing stuff so you can get everything's in one place so it's hypermarket oh, wow. type two stories like proper car parking do you know what I mean like you go in and you feel like well yeah i'm spending 10 grand on a bike i, I should feel like this yeah yeah oh it's wow. not so when they come to this country they're yeah. like well this is weird yeah <laughs> so it makes you know like the lesbian story buried that's yeah. like low grade yeah because that seems big to me yeah, it's yeah, like oh, i'm going it. to a proper bike yeah, shop yeah. today so imagine <laughs> that with like what well, is it ice and stuff underneath it yeah yeah, stuff. yeah, cool, yeah. the whole thing <laughs> that would still be a medium-sized bike shop right wow so you, you're right. I think the little shops that are mechanic in, that are servicing, and especially now you need to plug your e bike in and you get this, all that sort of stuff, yeah. that has a place. Yeah. And yeah, I think the medium sized ones are the ones that will struggle. Yeah. And it just depends how the money comes into it, into the industry. Because you know, the guy who bought Wheelbase, which is like a Leslie style stop, okay. they're now all in go outdoors. Right. Okay. So there's a go, there's a Wheelbase in. Oh, uh, right. Okay. So he bought that brand. So he got access to all the bike yeah, brands that they yeah. sell. Because yeah. a lot of people wouldn't sell to go outdoors. Yeah. But they sell to wheelbase. And uh, now the wheelbases are in go outdoors. Oh, uh, wow. Okay. Do you think we'll get the massive German style stores then? They sound mint. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we will do. I just think it's it's to do with the size of market. So people keep sort of trying it in a way. And it's mainly the bike brands that are trying it because they obviously make more margin if they sell direct. So yeah. they're a Trek store, a specialized store, or a giant store. But then you're only selling one brand of bike. Yeah. Whereas the stores in Germany are multi brands. Yeah. yeah. So, because those big brands stores are great. Because we used to have people come to us going, I want to be a KTM store. And it's like, yeah, great. But if someone doesn't like orange, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you're not going to sell the bike. You need a range of price points and a range of quality products at that price. Yeah. Point. You need a certain amount of space to do it. So, yeah, I think it'll, it'll go that way. Yeah. But we've got to get through this couple of years of carnage. Yeah, turmoil in the meantime. First. Yeah. yeah. And on that note, it's been an hour and 10 minutes already. I'm looking at my watch and wearing a whoop. It doesn't even have the time on it. No, uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for coming on. It's been great no getting your insight. All. And then uh, I'm looking forward to seeing where, where you end up in the next year or two. Yeah, well, I think it's uh, like me and the industry and everything else. It's going to be a uh, period of change. Few, yeah. So we'll see. Hopefully it comes out. Everything comes out in a positive yeah. way and no one struggles too much. But we'll Fingers see. crossed. Well, Col, thank you very much for coming back on. No problem at all. See you again.